next session we will be discussing on the different cross-border payment methods, main challenges of cross-border payments, remittances and bill payments, BBPS cross-border bill payments existing flow and way ahead for cross-border bill payments. For the same, we have our prominent speakers for this session. Can we please have Huge Fernandez, AI Mizani Exchange Company, KSCC, accompanying Shweta Shetty, Senior Lead, NBBL, and Rajan Tavate, In Charge Innovation, NBBL. Can we please have the speakers up front? Please put your hands together and welcome our esteemed speakers up here on stage. So thank you very much for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. So what an exciting day today. I think all of you, once you go back home, you'll require a foot massage, right, for the kind of walking that we did today. So good, after, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hugh Fernandez, and I work with a company called al Muzaini Exchange Company, which is the largest exchange house in Kuwait since 1942. We are the largest exchange house in terms of remittance market share or network of branches, which is nearly 135 branches, 50 kiosk machines, and a significant uh, digital presence. So for those of you who are not familiar with an exchange house concept, it's a pretty common phenomenon in the GCC. An exchange house is a regulated entity by the central bank of that country, where the main activity revolves around banknotes and sale and purchase of currencies. Besides that, there are certain markets which also have additional activities as provided to them by the regulators in terms of payroll issuance or uh, issuing of travel cards. But primarily, the activity of an exchange house revolves around uh, remittance and exchange of currencies. Moving ahead, okay, our agenda for today, okay, we would be talking about cross-border payments with emphasis on remittances, especially cross-border bill payments. So talking about cross-border payments, what are cross-border payments? Cross-border payments are nothing but payments which occur by two different parties located in different countries. These payments involve the transfer of funds or assets from one country to another, typically through banks or other financial institutions. These transactions can be initiated by individuals or businesses and often involve currency conversions that can be made using a variety of payment methods. Why are cross-border payments so important in today's day? Combined globalization, continued globalization, is driving the demand for a fast, secure, and efficient payment method. Cross-border payments today value at $190 trillion and expected to rise to $290 trillion by 2030, which is a massive amount. With this market exponentially growing, this space is attracting a high degree of competition from fintechs, money service businesses, and non-banks, who are looking to take advantage of the opportunities to expand and improve services to customers around the globe. Cross-border payments are important to businesses who want to expand into new territories, expand their customer base, and diversify their business and revenue streams as well. There are many solutions to these challenges. With the right payment method and strategies, business can reduce cost, improve cash flow, and accelerate growth. What are the common usage of cross-border payments? Most importantly, international trade, travel and tourism, remittances, investment, and of course, international charitable donations. Let's look at some of the cross-border payment methods, wire transfers, credit card transactions, electronic funds transfer, international money orders, online platforms, and cryptocurrencies. <coughs> Moving on, we would like to have a look at the benefits and drawbacks of cross-border payments. Some of the benefits include access to global market, 
Cross-border payments, as mentioned in my earlier slide, are critical for businesses who would like to venture into new territories, tap new customers, and so on. Increased revenue growth. Moving on from the domestic arena, going to an international platform, increases the revenue streams for these businesses. Di diversification. Cross-border payments ensure business diversify their customer base, supplier base, and investment portfolio, reducing the reliance on domestic markets. Further saving cost. Cross-border can be expensive. Choosing the right payment method okay, can enable businesses to reduce their costs. And of course, flexibility. Cross-border payment often offer businesses flexibility in terms of payment method, allowing them to choose the most convenient and cost-effective method for their business needs. The drawbacks, regulatory requirements. Cross-border payments are subject to regulatory requirements and complex compliance requirements, which sometimes can be difficult to navigate. Currency risks. Cross-border payments are subject to currency fluctuations where it affects the value of the goods, ultimately. And not to forget the fees and charges. As mentioned, cross-border payments can be expensive, and fees and charges may differ, vary upon country to country and payment method. Frauds and risk. With growing digitalization, fraud also has grown. So cross-border payments can be vulnerable to frauds and security risks such as cyber attacks, identity theft, and payment scams. Well, we can't forget operational complexities. Cross-border payments can be more complex and time-consuming to process than domestic payments, requiring businesses to hire additional resources with expertise to manage them effectively. What are the main challenges of cross-border payments? High costs, slow transactions, security issues, and a lack of transparency. Moving further, the subject that we're going to stay on for a little bit longer are remittances. So what are remittances? In my view, I look at remittances as social insurance. Remittances are simply nothing but money sent by migrant workers back home to their families. I've been in the remittance industry for well over 20 years, and we as an exchange house deal with a lots of migrant workers coming to us day in, day out, okay, to send their remittances. And it's amazing to see their stories and amazing to hear their stories, okay, uh, over a period of time. Many people live, you know, abroad and as an expat for a long period of time, sending money day in, day out every month. And sometimes you have customers come to us, sit with us, and would like to talk. And, you know, a, a, a migrant worker, okay, who probably might be a domestic worker, would earn somewhere around 300 to 400 dollars every month. Sometimes they would like to sit and talk and tell us stories as to how probably they would not be educated, but how they have made their children doctors and engineers. And it's very humbling, OK, to understand how migrant workers are important for any economy, especially a developing country. For a developing world, remittances are essential lifeline. And a significant portion of the global transfer of funds are made up of remittances. For migrants, they are, for migrants and their relatives, and friends who remain in their home countries. Remittance are an important and positive economic result of migration. At a micro level, remittances support growth and are less volatile than other private capital flows. A perfect example, the pandemic. During the pandemic, at the start of 2020, when the pandemic hit us, we as businesses never knew where the market is going in terms of payment. However, the remittance hold is ground. During the entire 2020 and partially in 2021, the remittance flows were resilient. People send money more than they used to do to support their families back home, you know, during these dark times. As a matter of fact, you know, I can, I can, I can give you an example specific to Kuwait where the Kuwait government 
was kind enough to put a monitorium in place with deferred the credit card payments and loan payments, okay, for everyone, locals as well as residents alike. This helped to offload, okay, the maximum amount which they could accumulate out of their salaries. Well, there was no restaurants to dine in, okay, there were no apparels, okay, where customers could go and purchase. The only thing what they could do is send in more money during the six months for a monitorium to their families back home. So this is a perfect example as to how remittance is stable even during the pandemic and during dark times. I mean, I believe in one thing, that as long as an expat or as long as an immigrant has a salary in place, hail come or storm, right, they will remit money back to their families. So in that sense, the stability of remittance, okay, is very, very important to a developing nation. Not only in terms, okay, of the forex, reserves. It also helps get developing nations out of poverty. For example, a migrant working worker sending money back home to their families who invest that money in the education of their children, who invest their money to bring food on the table, and also making an investment in terms of assets, whether it's liquid or whether it's ga gathering property. India is a perfect example of this strategy. How does remittance play an important role for an economy? Remittance are a private saving of workers and families that are sent in the home country for food, clothing, and other expenditures, and which drive the home, home economy. For many developing nations, remittance form citizens working abroad provide an important source of much needed funds. Well, just to put some stats in perspective, out of a staggering eight billion people worldwide, one in eight depend upon remittances. Every year, 200 million workers send money home and 800 million people benefit from them. Another point very important to the remittance is how technology has evolved in terms of remittances. I have been at the forefront of this technological transformation. Over a period of 20 years, I remember entering the remittance space where remittances were either sent through drafts, where a migrant worker used to take this draft, wait for someone to go back home, okay, to send this draft along with the worker so that their families can receive this check and deposit the monies in the account, or send it by courier. But courier used to be a very expensive proposition at that time, probably around $100 to send a remittance or a courier back home. So once the check has been delivered to the families, they would deposit these checks into banks. Banks would take probably a week or two to collect these particular checks, depending on where they were drawn on. So the entire proposition of a remittance, okay, was approximately around a couple of months. Fast forward, 15 to 20 years, and this entire dynamics have changed. And India proudly, okay, is a leader in that sense, in every sense, in terms of transforming real-time credits. So from drafts, okay, to sending payments through SWIFTs and through where we are today, in terms of real-time credits, okay, it's a fantastic transformation. Many countries in the in the uh, Asian countries, especially the Asian countries, our neighbors, and the South Asian countries as well, have transformed very, very recently. But India has been doing real-time credits for well over 10 years, right? So it's a, it's a marvelous achievement, and this also helps in terms of generating more remittances when you send money now and receive money now. So this technological advancement as well, okay, has helped the country garner the kind of remittances what we receive today. Well, the typical payout methods in remittances revolve around bank credits, cash over counter, and mobile wallets. All the cash over counter payments, okay, a typical Western Union transfer, say for example, where they are dealing with an agent, a beneficiary would go and, and cash their funds through remittances. These numbers are changing, and with the unbanked getting banked, okay, a lot of the remittance volumes are now moving into banks and up to recently, mobile wallets. So let's have some statistics, okay, on the origin of migrants, okay, to put a perspective, okay, as to why India till 
today, okay, is the largest receive, recipient of remittances. So as you see, India tops the list in terms of migrant workers leaving the country to go and earn a living, followed by Mexico, Russia, China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Ukraine, and the Philippines. Some more stats on the top receiving remittance countries. India undoubtedly is number one. India last year has crossed the 100 billion mark and is expected to grow at nearly 8 to 10 percent every year, followed by Mexico and China. In terms from where we receive our remittances from, number one being the United States, followed by the UAE, United Kingdom, and others. But an important point to note here, if you look at a few of the countries mentioned in the slide, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar, this formed the GCC, where the bulk of the migrants go to earn their living. What are the typical remittance use cases in India? The number one being family support, for medical health expenses. <coughs> Education plays a vital role there. Investments and entertainment. <coughs> Moving on to the next slide, which is bill payments. I am a huge believer of having bill payments as a cross-border proposition. Not because bill payments in the cross-border aspect is anything different from remittances, but it provides a specific purpose. It gives the control in the hand of the sender to ensure that the bill payments are being made on time. Very often, okay, me being an expat myself, okay, we have to pay bills back home. Many times we forget, many times I have to bother extended family and relatives to go and make bill payments. So. Having a bill payment proposition on a cross-border platform gives me controls in my hand to make these bills on time and not to default. Besides forgetting, also many a times we do have cases where monies have been sent to family to make bill payments and actually those bills are never paid, right? So they end up you know, sending money twice for the same purpose. So giving the baton in terms the flexibility to the remitter to send the money directly to the biller okay, is an absolute advantage in terms of convenience. I do not foresee bill payments enhancing the remittance volumes in any way. Yes, in terms of transactions, yes, but overall, no. But in terms of convenience, it's an absolute huge lifesaver for an expat or a migrant living abroad. A bill payment platform such as BPPS was already available domestically. However, extending that okay, to a cross-border was a very, very welcome and absolute pleasure from the uh, regulators as well. In hindsight, I recall speaking you know, to a few bankers exploring this particular opportunity of bill payments. And we have a few correspondent banks okay, who we deal with in India and everyone were interested, but the first one who actually saw a value in this prop proposition was Federal Bank. Federal Bank, when it comes on the technological front, okay, in terms of digitalization, they are quite advanced. So they took this matter ahead, and we were the first exchange house in Kuwait to launch BPPS, and it was a welcome by all the customers who were dealing with us. However, having said that, I believe that the bill payments what we're looking at today, okay, is not only going to be limited to utility bills or payment of insurance or payment of, you know, prepaid mobile uh, top-ups and so on. This will venture into something completely new in time to come. Besides launching BPPS, we were also the first exchange house, okay, to launch UPI in Kuwait. So, in terms of So in terms of the future of bill payments and how I see it going further in terms of convenience for people who are using the service, I'm pretty sure as time goes by, 
the technology will advance where billers would be able to push due dates, would be able to push billing cycles okay, directly to the customers in terms of notification, which enables them to do their payments instantly, securely, and on time. Right? This could go also to an extent where mandates have been given okay, for bills to be paid okay, either through their bank accounts or through wallets okay, going in the future. So I see a really, really good use case of bill payments as a cross-border uh, proposition. So some of the cases where bill payments are being made typically okay, are landline bills, gas bills, broadband bills, mobile bills, and utility, of course. So thank you very much. I would like uh, Rajan to probably you know, give his views on how BPVS is going to transform in terms of cross-border payments. Sure, sure. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much, you. That was a very good overview, actually, and I really would uh, like, you know, appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I'm Rajan from NPCI Bharat Bilpe. Uh, Bharat Bilpe? Sure. <laughs> So Bharat Bill Pay is a bill payments platform. Uh, we are a subset of NPCI. Uh, we have around 20,000 billers uh, on, on our platform. On the front end side, we have applications uh, like PhonePay, GPay. So we are a technology company. We have a set of APIs. A couple of APIs are like, you know, Fetch API, Pay API, and there's a Biller MD API. So uh, what really happens is like, you know, uh, and uh, uh, front end applications like PhonePay, GPay, they consume our APIs, and the applications are actually provided to the general users who use those applications to make bill payments, right? So if an, uh, any of you has made payments out of like phone pay, G pay for electricity, water, or gas, it's quite possible like, you know, it is, it is uh, routed to our BVPS platform. So until uh, this time, like, you know, we had 20,000 Indian billers on our platform and consumers of India were using these bill payments. Last year, we got approved from RBI to do cross-border bill payments. So a couple of countries have gone live, and I would request my colleague Shweta to talk about how the cross-border... I'll take this. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, I gave this to you. Oh, yeah. Okay. one and all over here. Uh, my name is Shweta Shetty and I am uh, from BBPS. Uh, so, uh, well, on the piece uh, that you took us over today, I think it was really a learning experience for all of us. And uh, with BBPS, um, you know, what have we done with BBPS? So, we are an RBI conceptualized interoperable uh, organization which uh, offers a platform uh, to apps, to banks, non-banks, to leverage bill payments. So bill payments is instant, bill payments is uh, secured. So that's all that a consumer needs today. And even the, uh, you know, the consumer grievances are dealt with in an instant payment method. So uh, we received RBI approval to launch a cross-border inward payment in 2022. We also launched it in the same month last year. We've gone live in three countries, uh, Kuwait, Oman, and Bahrain. Uh, We'll take it to the next slide. So partners today are Federal Bank, Canada Bank, and uh, we have SBI and South Indian Bank who are coming up with uh, more agent institutions. And when we say agent institutions, uh, these are the exchange houses that we are talking to. And the exchange houses are onboarded today as per the RBI approval. And uh, the, all the money exchanges and all the remittances abroad are happening through the money exchanges today. So, yeah. so I'll quickly uh, take you all through a flow. Okay, so typically what happens, you log into a mobile application of your partner, I mean the local, uh, uh, let's say Almuzaini, okay, because we have you, so Almuzaini's uh, app is used in Kuwait, the customer logs in, into his app, he selects the bill payment uh, category over there, he selects what bill he wants to pay, let's say over here the customer has chosen to make a loan repayment, he chooses the you know, he chooses to pay for this one organization that we have, the Housing Finance Limited Company, and uh, he enters the credentials that are required to uh, enter over there. So in local market, uh, we only show uh, local currency. But when it comes to a cross-border transaction, we are asking our partners to display both 
uh, the local currency in that market, you know, the prevailing country, and the, the currency over here in India. So the conversion is available to the customer. The customer is making a known decision of all the details which are available on the screen to him, and then he makes a payment. So you see this payment is instant. So as instant as it happens in India, we are giving the same experience to the customer outside of India. So basically, uh, you know, it's like bringing convenience to a customer who is living abroad. Now what we majorly see is loan repayment as a tool works for consumers who have gone out to work. So instead of them having to send money to one of their relatives in India, they can do it directly. Uh, you know, when you have relatives uh, staying in remote locations in India and you want to pay their bills, someone staying in the US now can pay directly using BBPS as a platform. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So joining BBPS is actually very easy. We say that uh, an exchange house has to select the customer OU. He has to give us the AI consent form. Uh, there are typical uh, standard APIs which we give out, which have to be consumed by the AIs through the OUs. And once it is done, the integration is completed between the AI and the OU. When I say AI, it is agent institution. That is the exchange house, which is operating out of India. And when I say OU, it is operating unit. That is uh, the banks, the non-banks that we spoke about, who are facilitating BBPS today in India. So this is the arrangement. And once all of that goes, we have a certification environment. We do a lot of, uh, you know, a round of certification. And after that, we take them live. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, on this note, I'll ask Rajan to put his uh, views sure. on what is the way ahead on uh, cross-border. Right. So, so far we have discussed cross-border incoming, wherein the customer is outside India, he wants to make India bill payments. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a diagram for cross-border outgoing. So there is the Indian parent who wants to make a fee for the payment of a student who has taken admission in a, in a US university like Harvard or Yale and he wants to make a payment. So there are a couple of aggregators who come into the picture over here. So there's an aggregator called Flywire which comes into the picture. So in, in our system, we have an entity of a customer operating unit and a biller operating unit. The customer operating unit are companies like, you know, PhonePay, GPA, they make the front-end applications for the customers. And the customer goes to their, uh, their application or their website and he selects the category. He fetches the bill for the education institute. He, he, he will see the amount in foreign currency. He will make a payment. That payment will go to an entity called biller operating unit. Now this will be AD1 banks only in India. So in India only certain banks are authorized to deal in foreign currency. Now these banks will collect the money. And what they will do is like, you know, through the nostro washto route, they will send the money to either to the aggregator like Flywire right, which is located in Singapore, or the money will go directly go to the US Institute, which can be Harvard or Yale. So this is like something which you're working upon in the future. So say, you want to add something over here? Well, uh, Rajan, I think it's an excellent mm -hmm. proposition, mm -hmm. simply for the reason is, uh, you know, I know many families, okay, who have, you know, uh, either traveling for medical expenses or either, either uh, medical treatment or having their children studying abroad. And, uh, you know, I feel their pain when it comes to making payments, okay, uh, you know, to a foreign country. Uh, although there are a couple of banks already in place, okay, which do this, but having this, uh, uh, you know, this proposition for the masses, okay, it's an absolute, uh, you know, uh, uh, amazing uh, facility. Yeah, so I, I really do see a good potential in uh, outward payments as well. Sure. Yeah. So do you want to add something? So basically uh, today, um, you know, when as an Indian parent, if I have to remit for my son's education abroad, uh, you know, I'll have to typically visit uh, the branch, a bank branch, unless it is an HDFC or an ICICI bank who is already offering online payments. Otherwise, you'll have to really visit. So when we are talking about masses, uh, we are saying that we want to simplify the entire situation. Okay, so what we are saying here is we have yet to receive approvals, but this is the way forward that we look at, uh, you know, cross-border outward payments. We are wanting to make things easier for Indians to pay for their known ones in, uh, you know, countries abroad, and uh, likewise. So, yeah, so yeah. that is just leveraging one, our platform right, right. Uh, for outward payments. Yeah, just one point we wanted to add over here. So there is a scheme called Liberalized Remittance Scheme of RBI, and you can only transfer more, less than $250,000 like per year. Now currently, that, there is a check to be done before the money is to be sent. Currently, that system is uh, not online. So we are working with uh, like, you know, the authorities to get whether we can get online access to that also. Like, you know, there is something in picture. Till that time, this will be like an offline check. Right. Next. So some of the
the use cases uh, like we already discussed as education institutes so let's say uh, you know uh, someone studying in new york university and uh, the parent is here so each time i don't have to uh, you know the parent does not have to send it to their son or the daughter who is studying abroad uh, they can intend directly make payments to the universities over there so what you're doing is essentially saving on everything else uh, like uh, the markup costs the exchange rates and you know transferring payments to your uh, child over there and you do not know if it's actually paid or not you know you want to trust but then it can actually be used also so you're just making sure that you pay to the educational institutions abroad uh, we thought of students international card so you know internationally this is a big market uh, when we talk so you know a lot of universities have these prepaid cards that are used uh, within the university campuses to pay for their mess to pay for their hostel fees and a lot of other things so you can top up these cards and we look at these to be one of the use cases for bbps and of course subscription so you know worldwide subscription is something which is high and uh, you know again a lot of use cases can come through on the platform so you want to add anything no absolutely uh, shweta i can't agree less okay this is an excellent proposition right another probably you know an addition i have uh, not on the outward but on the inward uh, I'll give you an example. Okay, one of the countries in the South, South Asian country, they use cross-border platform to send a bucket of chicken back to their family. This might sound amusing, but it's true, and there are takers for it. So, you know, probably somewhere in the future, okay, you never know. You know, cross-border payments, okay, can be extended. You know, for a migrant worker to, you know, order through Swiggy or Zomato. Okay, probably that's coming in, you know, uh, the future. So, uh, Rajan, uh, would you like to take this piece on innovations? This is, uh, like, you know, this is where, like, in a couple of years down the line, this might something happen for cross-border payments. So, currently, all the cross-border payments happen to the SWIFT framework. And the SWIFT payment network is very costly, like, you know, for a $1,000 SWIFT payment, it's almost like a $8 commission they charge, actually. So, given in the future, like, you know, it's quite possible that you will have a bilateral uh, tie-up between two countries. Oh, my. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm so sorry. Right, right, right. So, I'll just repeat actually. So, this is like, you know, something we we, have, uh, we can look for the future actually. Currently, all the payments which are happening are happening via the SWIFT network. The SWIFT network is like, you know, very costly uh, network and it costs uh, uh, like almost like 8 to $10 for a $1,000 transfer. So, in the future, what might happen like, you know, that there'll be bilateral arrangement between two countries for CBDC exchange and also like, you know, we could use uh, like, uh, uh, bit, uh, like, you know, uh, crypto networks like Ripple for like, you know, cross-border payments. So this is something which can uh, be planned in the future. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, please. TCS. OK. Right, right, right. So uh, I'll go a couple of slides back, huh, if you don't mind. So, so there are actually like, you know, two ways the TCS is charged, OK? Either you are paying for your own funds or you are paying from oh. There are two ways that TCS can be charged, like, you know, TCS is something like, you know, tax uh, collected at source, right? So either it can be like from your own funds or it can be the funds from, if you have borrowed the funds, right? If you have borrowed the funds, the TCS is only 0.5%. And if you are like, you know, taken uh, like, you know, from your own funds, it's around like 7%, right? So what we have done is like, you know, when the bill is fetched, right, there's a builder operating unit which will do the TCS calculation and that will be shown along with the bill to the CEO unit. The front end application will show the, show the base amount the amount in foreign currency, the TCS, the convenience fee. So there are a couple of fields which will be shown to the customer. We have developed the UI for that, which is not part of this presentation. But that is where it, that is how it will be taken care of. So sorry, we did not get your name, yeah, yeah. please. Can you? And you are from? Okay, fine. Okay, sure. Yeah. So we understand where you're coming from. I'm sorry to cut you, but uh, that's a good question also. So, uh, you know, TCS is something which is governed, right? So, as per whatever is the governing policy today, uh, we are going to follow everything. So, we are still saying that this is not an approved thing. So, we are working on the entire piece together. When we are working on it, our uh, biller operating unit will be a bank, which is an 81 licensed bank. That bank is very well capable today to handle cross-border payments, right? So they will look at the TCS, they will look at all the other arrangements that need to be made and also debiting it outside of India. So you, uh, the architecture will involve an 81 license bank for certain. Yeah, I trust that, that was, answer that was the question. That a good question actually. Yeah, yes. yeah please. Yeah. So we have a question about the, um, the bank account. Uh, I mean, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. For the CBDC implementation for cross border payments. Okay. So my assumption from this uh, presentation is that it will mostly be on the wholesale side that you will be using the cross border CBDC and not on the retail side. But is that correct? Sir? So, uh, currently, like, you know, we would not like to comment on the implementation of it. It is just like, you know, we are actually talking about the future over here. It is not in relation to the Indian CBDC as such. It is just about global payment trends. So, that is how it is. So. Yeah. yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank okay. you. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. we will not be able to take any more questions for okay. now. Okay. But they can go one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Thank you.